So I want to go over just a few things before you take the benchmark, just those last minute reminders of things that we've already covered. So when you receive a periodic table, and make sure you have a periodic table available, remember that the periodic table is organized into groups and periods. So we would write this out as groups, because groups go up and down. They are the columns on the periodic table. There are a total of 18 groups on the periodic table. Periods go side to side, and the way we remember that is when we write a sentence, you put a period at the end. When we look at the periods, there are seven periods. Now don't forget, period one is hydrogen and helium. Period two is lithium, beryllium, skips over to boron, carbon, and so on. Period three, sodium, magnesium, skips over to aluminum, and then continue on. The lanthanide and actinide would be period six and seven. Now there are some things that we need to remember about the groups and periods. So remember, when we talk about the groups, anything in the same group is going to be similar, right? So these are similar. How are they similar? They're similar because they have the similar properties, chemical reactivity and other properties. Not identical, but they behave in a similar way. So in this case, if I'm asking for phosphorus, Another element that would be similar to phosphorus uh, could be arsenic, antimony, bismuth, nitrogen. Anything in the same group is going to be similar. Now, if we also look at a periodic table, we know it is broken down into the three types of elements. So remember, we have our zigzag line. So the zigzag line is what is separating the metals and the nonmetals. So anything to the left of the zigzag line are going to be your metals. Anything to the right of the zigzag line are going to be your nonmetals. Now there is one exception to that, right? Don't forget, hydrogen is a nonmetal. It's over in group one because group one has one valence electron, so it matches. So we have the three types. Now we're going to look at eight man. So just as a quick reminder, how do we do 8-man? So to complete 8-man, we have to know what is the atomic number and what is the mass. Remember, we can get atomic number and mass from the periodic table. So if you look at the square on the periodic table, the number at the top is the atomic number. That's the A. Then to look at the number at the bottom, that's usually a decimal, that's the atomic mass. We always have to round this. So when we write this out, I usually like to write it up and down. This helps me remember that this is a math problem. So if I'm going to do silicon, my atomic number, A, is 14. So you're going to put that where the A is. We know that the atomic number is the number of protons. So we have 14 protons. I know protons have a positive charge. Electrons have a negative charge. We want our overall atom to have no charge, right? So we want no charge. So to cancel out my 14 positive, I also have to have 14 negative. So the atomic number is the number of protons, and the protons are equal to the number of electrons because I want no charge. Now my mass, 28.0 stays 28. Subtract 14, and I get 14 neutrons. Now remember, neutrons have no charge, so they're not going to affect the overall charge of the atom. So if we look at... 8-man, we're easily able to identify the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now remember, when we're talking about protons, protons are how we identify. So if you see the word identify, we're looking for the number of protons. Right? It's the only value that is unique to every atom. No two elements are going to have the same number of protons, because if you look at the periodic table, no two elements have the same atomic number. Right? Now, if we look at a model, we also have to look at valence electrons. So let's say I was making a model of this. Right? So inside my nucleus, I have protons and neutrons. My rules for the valence electrons are two sorry, not the valence, the Bohr model, two electrons in the first energy level, then that energy level is full. I can have up to eight 
in the second energy level, then that level is full. So right now I have 10 on my model and I'm trying to get to 14. So I have to go to a third energy level and add my remaining four. Now any electrons in the last energy level are what we call valence electrons. So my valence electrons are what determine reactivity. So these determine reactivity. Now we could go through and do a Bohr model every time we need to identify the number of valence electrons, or we could look at the patterns. So when we look at the periodic table, the group number is going to reference the number of valence electrons for groups 1 and 2 and 13 through 18. These guys in the middle are the transmit, tra sorry, transition metals. The rules don't apply. So if we look at the number at the top, so if I go back to my periodic table, right, the number at the top, 14, so this is group 14, look right below that, it says 4a, 4 valence electrons. Group 15, 5a, 5 valence electrons. So you can predict the number of valence electrons based on what group it's in. Now we said that they determine reactivity. Well, there are certain groups that are highly reactive, very unstable, because the goal of every atom is to get to eight valence electrons. Group one is highly reactive metals because it only has one valence electrons. It's far away from filling. Group 17 are highly reactive nonmetals because they have seven valence electrons. They really want one more. Now, group 18, on the other hand, are non-reactive. They are called the noble gases because they already have eight valence electrons, so they have a full outer shell. So let's continue our discussion here, and let's talk about counting atoms. So when we're asked to count atoms, we look at, I'm just going to Look at the whole compound. First, identify what elements do we find. Look at the capital letters. I have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and I have hydrogen again, so I only list it once. Then we look. I have one because there's no subscript, so I assume it to be one. I have three. Now, I have one, and then for hydrogen, I have four. But because I have a subscript outside the parentheses, I have to distribute it to everything inside. So I have to multiply that times 2, multiply that times 2. So if I'm looking for the total number of atoms, I have to add them. 1 plus 3 plus 8 plus 2. If I want the total number of hydrogen, I have to add those. 8, 9, 10, 11. All right. So just remember, if there's parentheses, you distribute what's outside to what's inside. All right, let's go to the next part. Uh, what about an equation? So again, uh, so if I look, everything to the left of the arrow is called a reactant. Everything to the right is called a product. Reactant, arrow, product, chemistry wrap. Now, whatever the mass is on each side, it has to be equal. So the mass of my reactants must equal the mass of my products. So if I were to just assign, I'm going to just do a random value here. So if this has a value of 50 grams, this has a value of 32 grams, what is my unknown value? Okay. So if we're asked to solve for that, I know that question mark plus 32 has to equal 50. So if I subtract out 32, I get my question mark, 18. So I know hydrogen has to have a value of 18. If I go backwards, 18 plus 32, is 50. Right? 
So make sure that you look to see that both sides are equal. All right. Don't forget uh, evidence of chemical reactions, right? We're looking for bubbling, fizzing, a uh, temperature change, right? Any of those would indicate that there has been a chemical reaction. All right, so skipping ahead to force and motion. So just a quick reminder on a few things in force and motion. Remember that we have motion graphs. Now there are two types of motion graphs. We have what's called a distance time graph, and then we also have what is called a speed graph, right? So we're going to look at these to see how they're different. So let's compare. So right now, I have two graphs that look identical. The difference is this one says distance, this one says speed. If I'm looking at distance and I have a horizontal line, that means the distance is not changing, so the object is not moving. But on a speed graph, if I'm looking at a horizontal line, that means the speed is not changing, so the object is traveling at a constant rate of speed. The next one, if we look again, in this graph, it's a distance time graph. Distance is increasing, so the object is moving away. In my speed graph, speed is increasing, so it is accelerating. Right. Distance time graph, where we have a negative slope, that means the object is moving back towards the origin. Negative slope on a speed graph indicates decreasing speed. Okay. Don't forget how to use your triangle. So we have force, mass, and acceleration. So for this, force is always on top. So if I'm solving for force, force equals mass times acceleration, because I cover the F, M times A. If I'm solving for mass, mass equals force divided by acceleration. If I'm solving for acceleration, force divided by mass. Okay. So make sure you look at those carefully. Now just to, one more thing to look at is speed, velocity, and acceleration. So speed is distance divided by time. So maybe uh, meters per uh, hour. Velocity is speed with a direction. So maybe it's meters per hour north. Acceleration is a change in velocity and it's meters per second squared. Right. All right, so that's just a quick overview of some of the things that you might need to know uh, on today's benchmark. Do your best, make sure you read each question carefully, and don't forget to check your units, check your calculations, check your periodic table. Use a calculator. Have a great day, gladiators.